Well, good evening, good morning or afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. I'm Carol Edmondson, uh, event host for Koshulio UK Women Empowerment event. And a warm welcome to our speakers and a warm welcome for those who have joined us to hear our speakers this evening. Um, a little bit about Koshulio UK that I am a host, a volunteer for, and I love volunteering on this platform because it resonates with my heart. Koshulia UK is a not registered, not-for-profit community organization to empower and uplift women. The founder is Ritu Sharma, who's here with us, who has and continues to dedicate her life to bringing women of this world to find their own power and true worth. Growing organically, the aim of the organization is to empower women, connect communities, raise awareness, of issues that affect women. And the unique objective of Koshulia UK is not just to support those who are in dire need, but also to support women who are on a journey to create a life of fulfillment through their personal, professional, and financial growth. So that's one of the projects, personal and professional financial growth, health and well-being, financial education and entrepreneurship. Uh, also, through another volunteer coordinator, Koshulia UK runs workshops. So if any of our speakers would like to do a 40 minute workshop, that is also an option too, as well as social events. Now, Koshulia UK has a social media presence, which includes a WhatsApp group, a Facebook page, and also a link tree uh, site where you can get the different links to the various YouTube channels and the website where this recording will be housed um, at some point and also will be put on our YouTube channel as well. So without further ado, as we get the evening started, if I could ask you all to put your uh, mics on mute and how this will play. I will introduce the speaker using their, um, just before they speak, using their bio to introduce them to the virtual stage. Once all four speakers have spoken, then I will open up the floor for questions and answers, um, which is all, always an amazing time because there's so many questions when we hear what the speakers have to share. And speakers, feel free to share your links within um, the chat as well. So here we go. It is and does give me great pleasure to introduce you to our first speaker for the evening. Oh, before I do that, there's just one thing I wanted to share actually. The heart of Koshulia UK and what um, Ritu is aiming to do now is to have one focal point for Koshulia UK, which resonates with her heart, and that is for doing more to help women who's experienced domestic violence. So we had funding for that last year. We don't this year, but working with the local authority, Ritu is trying to get premises where it would be almost like a drop-in centre, because this is very much, as I said, the ethos of what Koshulia UK stands for, helping and empowering women. Um, so, I will backtrack again now. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our first speaker, Shireen Lovegrove, joining us from London, UK. Shireen Lovegrove, an author, mental health, mental fitness and pregnancy coach and speaker. Her passion is helping professional pregnant women to have the pregnancy and birth they deserve. Many pregnant women struggle because they are caught in a power struggles between honoring both work and home life equally. Shireen helps them to stop and take a breath, reset their priority to what matters so they can happily enjoy their pregnancy, trusting they can successfully deal with any problems that crop up. Shireen has worked with hundreds of women successfully supporting them through various pregnancy related issues ranging from infertility, pregnancy and or birth complications and postnatal depression. 
And what she has found is that those children born of calm, happy and confident mothers are most likely to be more resilient, anti-fragile and successful throughout their lives. Shireen helps women through conscious pregnancy system, which is optimized to help pregnant mums develop the mental and emotional capacities that will support her to quickly self-regulate when challenges happen so that her baby intuitively, intuitively, I can't say that word, Shireen, <laughs> learns how to do this process automatically for themselves when they are born. So without further ado, I hand the stage and the floor over to you. You're on mute. Thank you, Carol. It's so lovely to be here and to, to speak with all of you. My journey towards freedom began when my book publisher first declared, it sounds like you have imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome? Is that one of those make-believe syndromes that people come up with to excuse or justify their failure? No, I really think you have imposter syndrome because your story is a textbook example of someone who's suffering with imposter syndrome. I had heard of imposter syndrome but before, but I, had, I dismissed it as not being a real psychological condition. It is still not listed as a diagnosis in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. I never thought to explore this condition, but as I started to research into it, into imposter syndrome, there was no doubt that I was suffering from it. And also perhaps why I choose a career of helping busy professional pregnant mums to navigate that tension between their work and home lives so they can make those optimal choices and decisions which are aligned with their health and the health of their child. I am so passionate about this because pregnancy is the only period in a child's life where a mother has the greatest direct influence on their genes. So any direct learning that occurs, with any direct learning that occurs, occurs without outside interference happening at this time. And evidence shows that babies born of mothers who have learned to downregulate that fear system through mental fitness practices are overall much calmer, more resilient, anti-fragile and successful in later life. But before I go further, I want to stress an important thing here of truly acknowledging that most women live in a context where they make shame-based meaning about when things go wrong. And I want to say here, that these feelings are normal given the context. If you are reacting now, wondering whether you have or haven't done something right, please know it's okay, even if it feels like it's taking you into blind panic. I want to say it's normal given the context, and I will explain about this later. Imposter phenomena was discovered by two psychologists, Dr. Suzanne Eames and Pauline Rose Clance. They questioned why highly functioning Achieving women, although at the top of their field, were unable to fulfill their potentials. These women were smart and capable and often had plenty of experience in the job they were doing already, and yet they were unable to step up into the positions of power. And oddly, many of them, when questioned, didn't even believe their level of capacity, despite the evidence, and they often discounted success when people pointed it out to them. According to Big Think, at least 70% of women executives suffering from imposter syndrome and will suffer from imposter syndrome, which means that a huge, huge resource of untapped potential is not being manifest. What would it be like if all this untapped potential were to be unleashed? Can you imagine what it'd be like if all people and their children were fully able to actualize their potentials? This is my mission, indirectly seeding skills to children to facilitate themselves to becoming the best humans that they can become. My book, Hiding in Plain Sight, No More, was intended to be a self-help book for women to move into sovereignty. 
But what it became was my story of power. Because for the first time, I was openly able to speak about my mother, who some might categorize as a narcissist. My mum was a strict disciplinarian and believed that children should be seen and not heard. And God forbid you did anything to make her feel embarrassed or ashamed. You knew about it, and she used any and every tactic available to her, starting with psychological manipulation, right throughout physical beating the, physically beating the daylights out of me. I was terrified to tell my story because there were people that knew her, which I was connected to, and who had never objected to the kind of discipline that she was giving me. And I was at risk of losing those connections that I had with those people. But writing my story also meant that I was exposing myself and my failures. How would this affect my clients, my colleagues' perceptions of me? Would they think less of me? Would they think I'm weak? Would they reject me? What I hadn't realized was they were, that I was really rejecting and persecuting myself. Writing the book, I got to see how growing up with an abusive mother that controlled and manipulated resulted in my imposter syndrome. I had totally discounted its impact on me. I just thought that's what it is. <clears throat> and as a therapist, you know, we focus on helping clients to solve their problems, not our own, because guess what? We're the expert. And as long as everything's chugging along, we don't tend to delve deeply into ourselves. Who wants to go looking for problems? Aren't there enough of them already, right? But as a therapist, I didn't even think I had a problem until I started writing my book. Opening myself and seeing what was really there made me realize I had lived my whole life in fear and hypervigilance. Fear had been the direct cause that I hadn't fulfilled my dream of becoming a medical doctor. This was the pinnacle I had set up for my life. Instead, what I saw was a failure, that I'd spent my entire life on this merry-go-round where I had been chasing, 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 course after course, and yet never feeling satisfied when I had completed them. A bit of a hungry ghost there. And even when I received a first-class pass in my psychology at 50 years of age and my master's in cognitive neuroscience, I didn't celebrate. And the reason why was because I felt it was pretty easy. And... I hadn't done enough work is what I was concerned, and therefore it couldn't be worth it. And then, well, I felt embarrassed. Classic imposter syndrome. Discounting my work, which meant that I had to stay on this hamster wheel. Just one more course would get me accepted into medical school until time ran out and I couldn't get onto the program. I also saw many, so many times over the years where I had been given opportunity to go into medicine, where influential people had actively offered to sponsor me. And I bought because I didn't want to go to the interviews because I was afraid to go in case I got what I truly wanted or failed, or they got to see that I was lacking and they didn't put me forward. Another characteristic of imposter syndrome, needing to be seen as an expert before I could put myself forward. And this legacy I got from my mum, who used to check our homework coming home, she felt we were never to be ordinary children. We needed to rise up and meet her impeccable standards. Unfortunately, there was never any gentleness, congratulations or maternal pride when I did incredibly well, and I did. Only the threat of a flat shoe if things went wrong. Totally discounted if I had done well. And right up to the time I went to boarding school at 12 years of age, I was the only child that ever wanted to go to boarding school. I dreaded my parents coming home from work because homework was going to be checked and God help you. And so striving to get things perfectly right was a very good survival strategy. At least it kept me safe. However, 
those childhood strategies didn't adapt well in adulthood. And so-called perfection has its flaws. When I went into private practice, I found it incredibly difficult to promote myself because what if I didn't know enough or perform well enough or didn't help anyone to the exact standard that I held for myself? So instead, I stayed in a personal safe space for many years. With work being this feast and famine affair, and this spilled on into business partnerships. I went into business partnerships because I didn't trust myself to do it alone. I didn't believe that I had enough expertise. These partnerships, as you guess it, were doomed to fail. As I got, up, got caught up in these con into controlling the detail, I was good at business plans, I was good at admin work, because that's what I really excelled at. But my business partner didn't like doing these things. And she kind of made all the kinds of ways out, standing out in the crowd. I thought this felt like an even distribution of work. But I literally, to be honest, ended up being an employee, not a partner. In fact, they told me this after acrimonious breakups. Ouch. And, you know, I did that twice. Ouch again. But probably the most devastating part of being of having imposter syndrome is that I left too late to start a family because I didn't think I could have both a successful career and a family. I had been pushed by my mother to really excel, but my father had other ideas. At 13 years of age, he told me, men don't like smart women. Message received. <clears throat> if I wanted to be loved, and have a family, I needed to hide that I was smart. My parents' relationship was challenging. I didn't understand things because my mother wore the pants in the family, and I was always getting these mixed messages, and I was incredibly conflicted. And I was also terrified that I'd end up like my mum because I could already see some of those controlling traits in me. I couldn't see. The one thing was that I was already different from her. However, at the time, I was too ashamed to ask for help and certainly couldn't ask for help from my partner because I'd been taught to do everything alone. Because to ask meant that I wasn't capable of being a mother, a strong mother. Another imposter syndrome characteristic. So all of these imposter syndrome traits and habits of doing things perfectly, needing to be an expert, Doing things alone were highly prized adaptive skills, which I had mastered perfectly, enough to ensure that I was safe from my mother's wrath. Breath. Did I benefit from these skills? Yes, I did. I eventually became proud of the fact that learning was incredibly easy. For me. I excelled at school and picked up things very quickly. My brother was so jealous of me because of the skills that I had. I had this extraordinary memory and I didn't have to study hard to get good grades. I was like the sponge. I was the encyclopedia. I was always, I kid you not. And I could remember and access information from everywhere that I could possibly find. And later I could make connections to and between things that seemed totally unrelated. This was my superpower. And it's a superpower I rely on today. However, anything built on fear is eventually going to crash. When you are so busy, busy putting fires out, you aren't building structures for thriving, the practical but necessary foundation that needs to be on firm ground. So you're trapped. And the only thing that you can do is to keep doing, 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 doing what you've always done. Because, hey, it worked in the past. And doing to make sure you stay on the top of the platform, or at least be seen to be like those beautiful swans that swim upstream looking so elegant. Yeah. But underneath, they're paddling and paddling so fast to try and keep ahead of the current. And we know that doing this constantly depletes energy, if not replenished. And so eventually, all that stress leads to burnout, breakdown, depression, and disease. Yeah, I ended up with IBS and my infertility. So writing my book 
was the greatest blessing I ever had because it gave me deep insights, not only into myself, but into my clients who were these professional pregnant women who came to me for issues that were pregnancy related. And of that, working with hundreds of women, I now believe that imposter syndrome is what drives most of the stress and the illness in this group. Imposter syndrome affects both men and women, but men and women experience it. Its effects vary differently, and that's due to their focus of, att of attention or orientation. Remember I spoke about women making shame-based meanings on the things they do? And this is because most women tend to base their success on who they are and men on what they do. So it's about a competency versus a state of being. If women fails to, to if she fails, she tends to make it, take it personally, who she is. I failed because I'm not good enough rather than what was done. I failed at the overall assignment. Oh, I can see I didn't have enough knowledge or resources available to fit the scope of the project. If you're basing your status on what you do, you can take action to change things. You can get more resources, but if it's about who you are, well, that's a lot, lot harder. But if we take this out into a wider context within these groups, masculine and feminine, male and female, if we take this out, imposter syndrome arises mainly in situations where people feel disenfranchised or feel less than. They're less academic, maybe creatives, they may come from different social classes, race or age or gender identity. In these situations, you can't change. You are who you are. But I feel this isn't the whole story of what causes women to place success or failures on who they are. Where did they learn to orientate this way? Knowing all of this doesn't fully explain imposter syndrome. It's certainly not in my book. And yes, there are those adaptive mechanisms above which are the direct result of childhood trauma. But I think there's more to it. And I believe the biggest reason is something called patriarchy stress disorder. The world has been dominated by the patriarchy for 6,000 years or so. And this system traditionally favors men and sees them as valuable and women as commodities. When women grow up knowing they don't have intrinsic value, they are not safe. Women have to find ways to prove they are valuable in order to create a means to stay safe. So according to patriarchy ideals, women are born, are not born with the intrinsic value that men have. Females have to earn their value. And traditionally, the value has been placed on women for childbearing capacity and where women and sometimes children are regarded as commodities. Still in our time, within many black cultures, women have to prove fertility before they can get married. In other cultures, girl babies are aborted because they cost too much of a dowry. Or even the safety of marriage isn't enough, where the case is a husband can say, I divorce you three times, and now the former wife is instantly made an outcast in the community because her husband didn't want her. And it's not just about that. Mothers are often placed in terribly conflicted positions where they try to do everything they can to protect themselves, whilst unknowingly still giving deference to their sons, which only perpetuates the cycle. And so many of my clients tell me they feel deeply ashamed and, and, a, and a failure when they can't conceive naturally, give birth perfectly, or they, you know, they, they, they can't breastfeed. And as for the expectations that mothers should be on duty 24-7, where the hell does that come from, right? Even when they have a full-time job, well, that just takes the cake for me, especially when they tell me that their husband works so hard. And so, oh no, they can't ask for help. They're devaluing their contribution and their anxiety. And it's so overwhelming for them at that time when I even asked that question or suggested for them. The truth is 
women are still paid on average 25% less than men. Men control the money and the power, all those powerful jobs. There is change, but it isn't happening fast enough or widespread enough as of yet. <clears throat> However, writing my book, I got to see something which was so valuable for me. I got to see that my mother was also a victim of imposter syndrome. Does that excuse her behavior? No, 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 it doesn't. Though I understand that my mother didn't know better and that she did the best that she could, given the context in which she grew up. Now, having done work on this, the anger has completely left me. And the anger, tell, I mean, trust me, it took time <laughs> to transform and grow into a deep understanding and empathy and forgiveness for her. And I can honestly say now that I love her and I can truly understand and forgive her. Now I can put myself in her shoes and really feel the pain and the distress she must have experienced growing up in an era where women were expected to follow traditional roles. In some cases, women might be resented if they, were, if they showed they were smarter or capable or better than men. Also, my mom was never acknowledged for being one of the first women to run money markets South Africa, and that must have hurt her greatly. So I can see now why my mother pushed me. She was the victim of patriarchy stress herself, which was definitely much worse for her than it was for me. I can see now why her children needed to succeed and also how us succeeding would validate her as a good mom. I was the one that got to university and studied neuroscience. I got to learn how the brain changes and to apply specific research-based techniques and strategies to help women deal with their imposter syndrome. My biggest and best work is understanding how these pieces all come together. And it's my honor to help women understand the context of why they make shame-based meaning when things go wrong, to normalize that reaction and begin the process of healing. And finally, have you ever noticed when trauma is healed, it has this strange way of healing the past, not making the past change, but our growth and our insight seems to place or orientate us differently onto another path. So it's not such a huge mountain to overcome anymore. And then the past comes, go, goes behind us, and what's behind us is being explored and provided insights and information on for what lies ahead of us. And it's our duty to appreciate the struggles of these women that have gone before us throughout generations so that we can do what we must do, be here now, shine our light so brightly that it lights up the entire universe. So thank you for listening to my story. And I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to speak with you. I'm Kayu Charlotte, and thank you, Carol, for asking Oh, how fantastic. Thank you, Shireen. Um, for those who joined later, we will be having a Q&A session once all four speakers have spoken. Um, but yeah, thank you, Shireen. And I will be asking your question later because having seen some of your posts on LinkedIn, um, amazing. So thank you. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Pamela J. Sams, joining us from Washington, D.C. Well, hey! <laughs> Hi, Pamela. So, for more than 20 years, Pamela has been helping women improve their personal and financial wealth through solid financial life planning. Pamela focuses on helping her clients secure their financial futures so they can sleep well at night. Pamela has become a strong voice in the area of personal finance for women. Her knowledge in this area has made her a sought after speaker. She has been quoted in articles in various financial publications. I yield the floor to you, Pamela, and screen Great. is available. Yes, let me see if I can figure this out for us to... Oh, where did my presentation go? 
bear with me, ladies and audience. <laughs> so, uh, let's see if this works now. And it's just a few slides that I want to go over. And I know this kind of works weird when you do it this way. So if you're not familiar with how Zoom works with sharing partial screen, this is how this works. <laughs> so uh, good evening. It's actually afternoon my time, but I appreciate the opportunity to come to you guys today and share. Uh, my presentation is all about uh, women, wealth, and well-being. Um, I was listening to uh, Dr. Shireen's uh, presentation, and a lot of what women deal with when it comes to our financial our finances is deeply rooted in the uh, the patriarch uh, syndrome, so to speak. Um, we're taught earlier in life as young women or young girls that the you know don't fuss over the numbers you know that some guy's gonna come and take care of you you know prince charming is gonna you know uh you know come and save you and don't worry your pretty little head about the numbers and so unfortunately we um as women tend to fall victim to that particular narrative where we're not focused in on our own finances um and so women wealth and well-being the presentation and i do this is probably the 20 minute version because i can do a whole workshop on this is really talks about how to build wealth number one but also the well-being part of that so carol had in uh, in my um intro or my bio talked about the sleep well at night. So that's why you see the SWAN motif is actually an acronym, which is means sleep, sleep well at night. Because what I found over the years of practicing for the last 21 years is that most people, especially women, um, we tend to kind of, you know, uh, really take it to heart and then we don't sleep well. And the well-being part of us physically could manifest in headaches or stomach aches or some things that um, that are not good for us. So if we're well with our money, hopefully we'll be well with our with our um, our physical being as well. So that's why I labeled it women wealth and well-being. Um, so statistically, uh, we just like uh, uh, Dr. Shireen had mentioned, we um, we tend to make less than men. And so that puts us behind the curve financially. Um, as well. And sometimes we're often out of the workforce caring for children, aging parents. So that affects our resources as it relates to saving uh, for our futures as well. The other piece of that is that women tend to live longer. So we need more resources. So really focusing in on the wealth part of what we need to do financially is what I will be focusing on today. So this is my information. Got to share that disclosure wise as a financial advisor. Um, I do have to share with you. This is um, information that I will share to you, not particular advice <laughs> that uh, that I cannot give, but it's some general information that will be beneficial for you as you start thinking about your own finances as well. So what do women really want? Um, when I think of this particular uh, title, I always think of this, oh, I think it was probably in the 90s or 80s or 90s movie with Mel Gibson, What Do Women Really Want? So it was one of those things where he was, from some freak accident that happened, he was able to tap into what women actually thought and was able to hear the thoughts. But as this is what women really want in terms of our finances. We want to be secure financially. We want to do things on our own. You know, if unfortunately we uh, we got married, unfortunately we became uh, divorced and or widowed. We want to make sure that we're secure financially on our own. That's number one. The second one is really feeling confident about investing. A lot of times we don't learn how to invest properly um, and we don't feel very confident in investing. So we tend to be a little bit more conservative as women. And unfortunately, that does not allow our money to grow appropriately and outpace inflation. So we want to make sure that we feel comfortable and confident when we're investing. So really learning the, the basics. 
Uh, I always recommend the the book uh, Intel the Intelligent Investor. It's a long old old book by Benjamin Graham. Probably dates back to um, I think you know early 1900s or so. But it has the fundamentals of how you need to invest. So really becoming confident with that. We want to make sure you're debt free. So you don't want to accumulate a lot of debt. Debt takes away from servicing our ongoing needs, takes away from our budgets if we're servicing debt. So if we're able to be debt free, we want to make sure we are that. Uh, balancing different goals, because uh, we have as women and probably a lot of people as well, we have a, little, a lot of different things that we want to do. We want to make sure we have a comfortable retirement in the future. It could be that we are saving for our first home, uh, sending our children to college, saving for you know a new car, whatever the case may be, we have different goals and they are prioritized differently as well on how we need to um, invest for that. But as we balancing those different goals, how do you do that? How do you prioritize as you go along? You wanna invest to fulfill your goals. So that's how you, um, that's how you accumulate wealth. So there is, Savings. We know we have savings that you put money away um, in a bank or checking account or money market accounts for that. But for the longer term growth accumulation part, we need to invest to fulfill your goals. The bank is only going to pay you so much. We do have to um, expose some of that to um, market exposure for the potential growth. So you want to invest and in, uh, make sure you uh, invest to fulfill your goals. And you want to learn, we want to learn more about investing. I mentioned the Benjamin Graham book, but there's a variety of different tools and resources that are out there. Investopedia is a good resource. Uh, if you want to go, it's a online site that has any and everything that you want to know about personal finance, particular investing. You know, I do, I, I used to um, write some columns for them. So Investopedia is a good resource, but anywhere you can find out about how to invest more efficiently is where you want to take a look at. So those are some things that what women want as it relates to their personal finances. So let's look at how you build your financial foundation. So there's five steps and I left, left it to five because I know I only have 20 minutes uh, in this. And so we'll go through them one by one. So the first one is to get organized. So we have a lot of different things that come into our lives and we want to make sure that they're organized appropriately. So with your finances, there are four key areas. So there's five, five steps to building your foundation, uh, financial foundation, but there are actually four areas of getting organized in your financial life. I call it the matrix of financial wellness. The first area is all about cash management. So that's how much you're uh, bringing into your household what's going out of your household. Do you have a budget and are you following your budget? Um, what, um, what type of debts do you have? What debt servicing, that could be your mortgage, it could be a car loan, it could be a student loan. So what type of debts you have, personal loans. Um, it also has your cash reserve uh, into that cash management matrix. So this is looking at um, for basically four to six months worth of your living expenses any cash or liquid type investment if you need to get to it right away. So that would prevent you from accumulating debt um, is where you wanna focus in on building about four to six months worth of your living expenses. So for example, if it takes about $5,000, uh, I know that the, 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 um, the conversion rate <laughs> with pounds may be a little bit different, but uh, with 5,000, uh, six months worth of living expenses would be about 30,000. Now, I know that's a big chunk of change for a lot of people, but I always say, how do, you, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So just really getting started with some type of savings program to build up your cash reserve. So that's where uh, cash management, that first quadrant in your matrix. The second quadrant in your matrix is about your risk management programs. These are your insurance type programs. So this would be uh, health insurance, life insurance, disability insurance, long-term care insurance, homeowners, medical, all of that would live in the second quadrant, which is uh, in insurance, uh, risk management insurance. So really taking a track list on, do I have these particular um, insurances? And if you don't, 
making sure you do have those or what the coverages are. A lot of times people don't revisit where they are with their coverage and their certain insurance programs. So you wanna take a look at how you do that on an annual basis um, and to revisit, especially if you have uh, an employer plan, there's open enrollment each year. So if, are there things that came off or come on, making sure you have the efficient amount of insurances. So that's quadrant two. Quadrant three of your matrix is all about your investment management. Where are you invested? How are you invested? How much are you investing? What are you investing for? Could be for the retirement, could be for the college planning, it could be for the down payment for a new home, whatever you're invested in. Again, you want to review your portfolio annually and rebalance accordingly because our balance, our our investments shift throughout the year, uh, especially you know with what's going on with markets across the uh, global markets. You want to make sure you're not taking on too much risk for your particular goals that we talked about before, defining and fulfilling your goals. So quadrant three is all about your investment management. Quadrant four of your matrix rounds it out with legacy planning. So that's estate plans. Do I have a will? Do I have a trust? Do I have um, the powers of attorney? Do I have the healthcare directive? So if something happens to you at birth, somebody needs to make your medical decisions. Do you have these things in place? So that's all about getting organized as part of your financial foundation. The second piece is defining your goals. So what do you want to save for? Um, again, mentioning most of the common goals that people say for is their long-term retirement. What is that gonna look like? You want to envision what retirement is going to look like, both from a lifestyle as well as how much you're going to need. Your lifestyle is actually, the, how much you're going to need is actually based on your lifestyle. So do you want to downsize? Are you going to stay in the same location? Will you relocate? Um, will you, you know, you know, for, 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 for my particular situation, my husband wants to do this multi-generational home situation. So we will actually not downsize, we'll actually grow. Uh, so we can, you know, accommodate grandkids, children and grandkids and things like that. So that's going to look totally different than uh, most, most people's retirement plan. So whatever your lifestyle is going to look like, this is how you need to plan accordingly with defining your goals. So each goal will have its own time horizon. In its own, in its own uh, matrix or um, uh, the things that you want to put in place for that. So if saving for a house within the next two or three years, it's going to look a lot differently on how you invest than if you're planning for retirement 25 to 30 years out. OK, but defining your goals is where that second step in your foundation. So knowing your numbers. So how much does it take to run your household? A lot of times, unfortunately, people veer away from that dreaded B word budget uh, because they think it's more restrictive and I, nobody wants to be restricted with their money. But it's really an awareness tool. Budgeting is an awareness tool. Where are my dollars going and how do I kind of put names on my particular dollars? Where is it um, that's efficiently working for me in my household? So I like to call it maybe a financial roadmap and not a budget, not a budget to stay away from that dreaded B word, but knowing where what number that is, well, uh, just as you need to know how much it would take to uh, secure your retirement for the future. So again, I mentioned your lifestyle, what that's going to look like. What, do you th what, are, you, what are you going to need in order to achieve that particular lifestyle? A lot of times people, uh, professionals like myself and others in the industry, it can be somewhere between 75 to 95% of your current lifestyle. Sometimes it can be actually 100, depending on the things you wanna do. So what I get most of the time is, Pam, now that I have 24 seven, I probably wanna do a lot of traveling. Traveling costs money, so actually you can end up spending a lot more than you would in, um, than you do now, because you have a lot of increased expenses with that. There are three different phases of retirement, just to kind of go through those briefly with you. Uh, the first phase is the go-go years. So the first part of your retirement, you'll probably spend a little bit more because you're doing the traveling, the hobbies, and those sort of things. The second phase goes into the slow-go years. You've done everything that you wanted to do with your lifestyle, so you're slowing down a little bit. You can actually end up spending a little bit less in that phase. And then phase three is the uh, no-go years. So you're aging, and you're, um, 
and you're not go moving or going anywhere, but you can actually end up spending more in that particular phase because of healthcare, increased healthcare costs, long-term care, nursing home care in that. So as you plan in accordingly and knowing your numbers, that's where you need to, to take a look at those three different phases kind of of your longer term. And get invested, you know, that that's how you basically develop your particular financial plan is how do I invest for these particular goals? So foundation number four is making sure you get invested um, and planning for your unique life path. Everybody's path is going to be different. Um, you know, I, I call it kind of the water cooler talk, you know, when, when people would be at the water cooler, hey, what what are you doing for, you know, X, Y, Z, for your savings, for your college or retirement? Everybody's plan is going to be unique. So really plan for your particular situation. And life happens as well. You know, you could plan a well laid out plan to retire together. And then unfortunately, you become a widow. That's what happened uh, with my mother. That's actually how I got into this industry have a, a degree in master's degree in financial management, but thinking I was going to be the, the big Wall Street guru, that sort of thing. And life changed and I was able to step in and help my mother with her transition. So life looks a lot differently for a widow than when you were married and you're planning for um, a retirement together. Same thing if you become divorced. So everybody's plan is going to look unique and different for that. So I know I have uh, a few more minutes. I want to kind of cut this short a little bit to show you kind of the last slide uh, for that. So, you know, this is a brief session. This is about 20 minutes. It is part of a longer 45 minutes to an hour, probably can be a whole half day workshop. But, you know, if you want to take, a, uh, this is my information. Uh, of course, I'm always open to uh, feedback for this particular presentation, uh, or if you're interested in bringing me on for a longer presentation, that would be awesome. And of course, my, uh, my uh, social media handles and my LinkedIn handle are on there as well. Uh, so I do appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you today, and I uh, look forward to some of the questions out of uh, this presentation. Thank you very much, for Carol, for inviting me, and I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you. It's amazing. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think I'm in. St I think I'm forever in stage three. <laughs> Not with ill health, not with the aging, but just situation. <laughs> so, yeah, I look forward to the Q&A at the end, Pamela. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, OK, again, Q&A when all four speakers have spoken. Um, so sit tight, our audience. Uh, gives me great pleasure now to introduce you to our third speaker this evening, who is Sarah J. Naylor joining us from Nottingham in the UK, and her motto, making midlife magical. Sarah helps midlife women in their 40s and 50s rediscover or even discover who they are as they reach this magical midpoint in their lives. She helps them put some, <laughs> wait for it, <laughs> some sass in their ass. <laughs> and propel themselves forward with strength and style. In fact, she's on a mission to get midlife women enjoying all aspects of their life again. That includes loving and valuing themselves, being cared for, enjoying, mm, great, <laughs> great sex. <laughs> kickstarting their careers and believing that their age and every beautiful wrinkle brings with it wisdom and experience. Age, Sarah states, is their superpower. And I would thoroughly agree with that sentiment and statement, Sarah. <laughs> I yield the floor to you. You're on mute. I was just about to say I better unmute myself. <laughs> thank you so much, Carol, and thank you for inviting me. And hello, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to be here and I say share my story, which is what I'm going to do today. So this is a little bit more, it's a little different to how I would normally, well, I don't 
normally say deliver talks, etc. But this is more about me and my journey, my journey, my story, to be perfectly honest. Um, so starting right at the beginning, um, I'm going to quickly give you a synopsis of where I'm at now and then really take you back over the last 18 years. And then we'll come right up to date and I can explain to you exactly where I am in a bit more detail. So as I said to Carol, do this to me <laughs> if I'm going over. But if I'm going under, all the better, really. <laughs> so I've tried to uh, keep my notes down to a minimum. So who am I? Today, well, I'm calling myself Sarah J. Naylor um, because it turned out there are quite a lot of other Sarah Naylors out there. So I wanted to add my middle initial in to just to, to make me a little bit different. And I am the midlife success coach. I am a businesswoman, entrepreneur, author, speaker and podcast host. That is me today. However, if we go back 18 years, I was getting divorced. I had just ended a 20 year relationship with my obviously now ex-husband uh, after 20 years. And yeah, I'd met him when I was 19 and I was getting divorced age 39. It had been a challenging relationship and uh, Shireen mentioned narcissism earlier on. And yeah, it wasn't until very recently, probably in the last six months or so, that I actually realised for all those 20 years, I was actually living with a narcissist. I couldn't do right for doing wrong for the best part of it, but it really came to light after I'd had our son. And that was in 1999. So those last six years together were particularly challenging you know it got to the point where I would well a prior to getting to this point I'm going to mention um I used to say I just let it wash over me because he how he was with me he was with other family members and it was it was hard I just I just accepted that's who he was and you know right up until recently I accepted my part for allowing it to happen but now I understand how narcissism operates and actually that's them and you taking the blame for a person being a narcissist that's not right <laughs> actually you know it happens around you and you adapt to to live with that person which is exactly what I did and you know, I, I just literally couldn't do right for doing wrong in the end. And I used to get to the point of asking him um, if it was OK to ask him a question, because I never knew how he would respond. I mean, he wasn't physical, um, but it was. Yeah, it was it was hard, but I won't go into the details how it all sort of came apart. But effectively, at the end of 2004 um, and beginning of 2005, I was suddenly at the solicitors instigating a divorce. And then I spent three months living in the same house as my ex-husband until my um, then boss intervened and spoke to my parents directly and said, you need to get her out of this house because I was clearly um, living through. A, well, at that point, I was living through a breakdown, to be quite honest. I don't know how I did it, but I ended up back at my parents in my old bedroom, sharing it with my six year old son. and. Um, Followed that with a court case and he had barristers and, well, barristers were involved and effectively he lost out because he was pretty much in contempt of the court, to be quite honest. But it was it was really tough because actually up until that point, we'd just gone to been to Australia and we'd been looking at relocating out there. It, it had been great. We'd actually been out, we'd been socialising and it seemed wonderful how quickly things can change. But by gum <laughs> yeah they did change from that point onwards and one thing he said to me 18 months after I divorced him was that he said you've become the person that you would have been if it hadn't been for me that says a thing or two doesn't it and but he was right I have become the person I would have been if it had not been for him <laughs> but actually it wasn't meant as a compliment so that brings me to 2005. This was the year I got divorced um, and suddenly had to start my life from scratch. So in 2005, after the end of a 20 year relationship back home in my old old bedroom, I was having to start life because I had no friends. I had been during that time manipulative unknowingly 
away from any friends, relationships. I socialised with his family. I'd been in recruitment, so I'd got like this, what I perceived to be a social life through work. And in fact, I used to joke at the time I'd got into entering competitions. And I used to say to people at work, oh, I don't have a life. I just enter competitions. And it's it's really strange because your life, you, you become this life. And, and when you have been separated from what is normal, you don't know what normal is. Your normal is your normal. And you have a no perspective on it. So my life back then was just being at home. I hadn't been out. I hadn't been out for six years. Not out, out. I'd been to children's play areas. I'd been to people's parties, you know, like in children, you know, children's parties, children's play areas, family. And that was it. I hadn't been out, out. Um, I'd never been to a coffee shop. I'd never been to a wine bar. I, the friends that I had had, one was in a, no, one, one was in France. Someone had gone traveling to India. One was in further down the country. So literally, yes, I'd left, but I had no friends. But fortunately, on that Christmas Eve, one of the girls that I was friendly with at work and took me along to another friend's New Year's Eve party. So I started to make a few friends then. I made friends with somebody at the school gate, one of my son's um, friend's mum, who was a bit of a party animal. <laughs> she should never have introduced me to Red Bull. I can tell you that for nothing. <laughs> that five cans six cans that one night I didn't sleep that was yeah that was a not a good experience but essentially I it, heading into my 40th year I was having my 20s in my 40s I was going out I was it I started dating again in my 40s it was like oh and I had my my first boyfriend was 10 years younger than me <laughs> result um, you know that didn't last but you know we're still friends to this day and every so often he'll drop me a message and go you know I've seen you post on LinkedIn if you want any help with anything you know great guy great guy but you know during those years when I was with my ex-husband I was busy supporting him in his business I mean I've already referred to his narcissism he could he, from a year on in from us being together he was self-employed he couldn't actually work for anybody else and I just supported him in his business and just worked as a recruitment consultant within a recruitment industry. Um, and the one opportunity I'd had at management, you know, being put on a management development program had been thwarted by him right early on. So, so yeah, so within that year, though, getting divorced, so obviously I got divorced. I, I spent nine months back at home with my parents. We survived, just. <laughs> we made it work. And then by the end of the year, I'd got my first house on my own as a single parent uh, with my son yeah wow and that was say back end of 20 um 20 well 2005 um so those next few years so the 40s I sort of moved into where were we the, the noughties so we're, we're motoring into the end of the noughties and as we know there was the recession that hit uh, and that was impacting then the working environment that I was within the I'd been with the same company 13 years and you know uh, the amazing woman that it intervened she and her husband who ran the business were getting divorced and as you can probably tell already quite upbeat and positive I've got lots of energy I was walking into this business and it was draining me I really couldn't work there anymore but where did I go as I've said I hadn't done any management development I just stayed still as a recruitment consultant been working in recruitment since 1987. So you know, where do I go? What do I do? How do I fit in? Now, if I go back to 13 years, I'd manifested that opportunity into that particular recruitment company. And here I was again, working out where it was I needed to go. Well, where do I fit in? What do I, who do I go and work for? I don't understand. I'm, I know too much for certain businesses, don't know enough for others. Anyway, I narrowed it down to being going to what I needed to work for was a small business and helping them grow their business. And you know what it's like? I mean, however many of you in the room or are on the spiritual spectrum, understand manifestation. When you get clear, you recognize those opportunities as they present themselves. And suddenly out of the blue, I had two people that I've never spoken to before approach me about two identical opportunities, helping these individuals with their businesses on a self-employed basis met with them both 
And as a single mother, <laughs> at the height of a recession, I then went and took one of these opportunities. I had to go and write a business plan for the very first time in my life, age 40, um, get a bank loan and keep me going for six months. And I embarked on self-employment underneath the umbrella of another recruiter. And yeah, I mean, I have to say that experience in itself, that stood me in good stead for a very, very long time, even to this day. But, you know, so that was that was a situation that I didn't feel that there was any other opportunity for me to do other than take that route. And I've never regretted it, never regretted it. So that was in 2009. And then as we hit 2010, I met another man. Hurrah. Well, hurrah, hurrah. He kind of moved in. <laughs> You know, I think I must have still been naive, you know. Anyway, another challenging relationship. This one was very jealous. There was a lot of stuff that was great. We did loads. I'm a very much of an active person. We did lots of outdoor activities together, but really, yeah, jealous man. But do you know what? I'm grateful for the time that we had together because it took me on an even deeper spiritual journey. I learned Reiki, I experienced EFT, I did lots of shamanic stuff. I've done regressional hypnotherapy and it was during my time with him that I then trained and qualified as a coach and I also then set up my limited company as a recruitment consultant so whereas I've been working before as a self-employed agent I was now running my own business properly you know underneath a limited company umbrella so massive stuff but you know I'd met him and then five and a half years later, I mean, this, as I said, it was a challenging relationship. There was a lot of shifts. My personal development was, a spiritual development kept on going. I was really invested in it. He'd got to a point of um, not wanting to do any more of that, which was fine. But there was this sort of gap and I won't go into the detail. It's not right for this right here, right now. But effectively about five weeks before my 50th birthday party, which he was helping me to organise, he left. Just left and left me with everything to sort out including a house in South Wales which we'd bought together on a buy to let basis because he was from South Wales it was like next door but two to his parents yeah so I was left with and coming to what all Pam was saying you know finances the lot I was having to sort it all out um yeah and I'm single again in my 50s yeah, my mother used to send me clips out of the paper about how challenging it was for people in their 50s to find relationships. So, cheers, mum. <laughs> Great. But do you know what? I made the decision there and then. I thought, do you know what? That's it. I would rather be single and enjoy my life than be in another challenging relationship. I can get the challenges that I need through my work. <laughs> Just be careful what you wish for, Sarah, <laughs> is all I would say to anybody listening. So in my, in my 50s, in my mid early 50s, I, it's been great. I embarked on solo travel, yoga retreats abroad. I went, on, I went off and took myself off to the Camino de Santiago in Spain. I spent 11 days on there walking and meeting people. I took on a cleaner. I took on a part-time administrator to help me build my business up. I took my business then from my home into the village. Uh, I embarked on trying to expand my business by taking on staff, be they um, self-employed, interns, people wanting to get into recruitment, only to find they then wanted to go off to Australia, to New Zealand, to do other things. It's like, <laughs> I now know why I never wanted to do management, really. <laughs> yeah, and so I got involved in more spiritual development. I really pushed myself I booked myself to deliver my first ever talk, not online, not locally, no, on the best U Expo stage at the Excel in London. Just, just go in the whole hog. Step up, step out, step in. And then I went, oh, yeah, probably need something to promote, don't I? Um, yeah, better write a book. <laughs> so I just thought, right, brain dump. And then it was like, oh, my gosh. Anyway, managed to manifest an amazing book editor who's a fantastic friend to this day. Pushed back the Best You Expo to the following year. Published my first book. -da -da! Shining a light on you. How to manifest your dream job. 
which actually combines my career in recruitment, my coaching and my spiritual ethos as knowing, as I have done, that it is possible to manifest your dream job because I have done it time and time again. And I know it's possible when you get clear, you know what it is you're looking for and you can recognise the opportunities and you act upon them. And if you've ever heard of Rob Moore, in his book, Life Leverage, he says, the law of attraction without action is a distraction. So, yeah, you've got to take action when you uh, when you want to manifest. It's not about sitting there waiting for it to happen whilst you're watching uh, Housewives of California or whichever one it is, <laughs> or Coronation Street or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, so I had an amazing time um, really building up my business. Book the slot, promote, um, publish my book. And 2019, 2020, I mean, I don't know where everybody else is turnover wise, but I just hit the 200,000 mark, 200,000 turnover mark. Not a great deal to many, but for me, it was like a real milestone. It was like, yeah. And then guess what? COVID. COVID hit and knocked seven bells out of everything that I'd been doing with a sledgehammer. So all the stuff I'd got going on recruitment wise, going, Yes, I've got some coaching going on, but because I've been focused on building my business up and I've got other challenges going on personally with my son and having a garage conversion challenged with insurance assessors and da 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 Yeah. So anyway, COVID hit. I had to bring my business back home. I had to take the bounce back alone ultimately. Um, but, you know, I seized initially, I seized the opportunity. I saw it for what it was. I, this isn't going to happen again. I need to maximize this opportunity. So I revisited marketing training. I set up a YouTube channel um, focusing on careers and careers advice and interviewing and having guest speakers about co their career stories and um, to inspire and motivate other people. And to this day now, whenever I'm sending candidates for interviews in my recruitment business, I'm sending them links to the stuff that I did three years ago um, on YouTube to help them with prepare for interviews with competency based interviews and things like that. I turned my book into an online course as well. I spent a lot, a lot of time investing in that. I signed up for even more training, which saw me network and connect with people in the States, in South America, in New Zealand, Australia, Hong Kong, up and down the UK. And I think it's through doing all of that is how I met Carol. I've networked, signed up for more social media marketing. I've also launched my podcast, which I did in 2021. Um, I've co-authored another book, which is the uh, My Dad Thinks I'm a Fairy, of which part of what I'm talking about is a chapter within this book. Uh, I've still got my rental property in South Wales. And I'm a lockdown love affair. I have a new relationship and we've been together three years and we've now in the process of moving house together and setting up home together somewhere else. But we have been together three years. And I've just about kept my businesses going, just kept them going. The last six months, I'll be brutally honest, have been exceptionally challenging. I was embarked on some more marketing training. I've had to cancel that. Recruitment, if anybody has any experience in the recruitment market, it has been because of COVID, because of Brexit, because of everything that's going on, it is exceedingly challenging. And I know it's not just me, despite me going into my dark days and thinking, Bit of self-sabotage there, Shireen. Um, it's me, it's me, it's me. I'm doing it all wrong. <laughs> I've 35 years experience. I'm still doing it wrong. Bang, bang, bang. Knock myself out. Um, you know, and the coaching market is awash with coaches who are being sold the dream and they're not necessarily coaches. I owe the bounce back loan. I've got tax and corporation tax to pay back. I had to make my office manager, the lady I took on seven years ago as a part time, I made her full time in, a, in, in I got up to about five staff at one time. I had to make her redundant in, at the end of March. We've had ongoing issues with my partner's house that should have sold a year ago, but because it's a shared ownership scheme, et cetera, it's caused all sorts of problems. It was sold again in January to cash, cash buyers, but because they're from Hong Kong and that you'll understand this, Pam, they've moved their money around to get better interest rates. But it's caused compliance issues. And it's <laughs> seriously, talk about channeling in resilience. But we're, we're selling to put ourselves in a better position financially. We're selling to, you know, with, you're talking about life um, choices. 
we, you know, we're selling to be closer to the coast because we like to swim in the sea. We like to trail run. We like to run off the cycle bikes. We want a better lifestyle for ourselves. My son hasn't spoken to me since Jan, since February. That's another story, perhaps for another day, unless Carol says, oh, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> um, I won't lie. It's been ex exceedingly challenging. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. You know, there are there is stuff that's happening. We we've put an offer in our house. It's been accepted. Our houses have sold. I've um, had a new coaching client start today, which is amazing on a on a six, one of my three month programs. But do you know what? It, going self-employed, like I said, at the right at the early on at the, the height of the recession, I've, I've had that stay with me. You know, do that without any support apart from bank loan to keep me going for three for six months. That's really sort of stayed with me. And when I was reflecting back on how I'd survived that first part of the um, COVID was what I then coined my eight mindset methodology. I can't say it, eight mindset methodology. And the APE is an acronym. It's acceptance, perspective and energy. So it's accepting what you can and you can't change. It's then shifting your perspective around that situation you find yourself in and channeling your energy accordingly. So, yes, you know, don't get me wrong. The last six months have seen me really sort of banging my head and going, holy, holy, seriously, man. You know, I've had this belief. I believe everything's working out wonderfully. I'm a great believer in, you know, what will be, will be. But sometimes even that can be challenged. And even when I've got my methodology, it can be challenged. So I know that I've had to dig deep. I've had to have that resilience. And this is all the stuff that when I'm working with my coaching clients, you know, and anybody that kind of comes into my orbit generally, I like to share because I know, um, oh, time up. <laughs> one minute I'm nearly on board yay <laughs> so yeah that, that's where I'm at basically that's what I'm passionate about is a is helping people through sharing my story um bringing that into all that I do throwing in a shed load of positive positivity self-belief remaining strong remaining in that belief that everything is working out wonderfully yeah that's about it folks and really life's an illusion of your own creation so it's really how you want to see it and you want to perceive it and yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you for inviting me. I'll pop some I'll pop some links or whatever in the chat. But effectively, Sarah J Naylor on LinkedIn, sarahjnaylor.com website, or you can contact me on my mobile or via emails. It's all available via my website. So yeah, please do get in touch and connect. Thank you very much again. Sarah, amazing. I just love your personality. Oh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Absolutely. And your personality has carried you through the tough times. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, there's so much more I could say. But yeah, we'll, <laughs> oh, say, we'll you. save it. Well, we'll thank save you for it. having me anyway. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, don't go anywhere. So our final speaker for this evening is Angela Thompson, joining us from Bristol in the UK. Currently, as founder of White Tiger, Angela is putting her business mentoring and process mapping skills together to improve efficiency, clarity and excellence in the workplace, equipping business owners with the skills they need to move forward on their growth journey. Angela's mission is to allow everyone to do what they love and love what they do. Her purpose on this planet is to enable light workers. What does that mean? To empower and motivate all those who are here to make a difference in this world to succeed on their journey. Angela works on an energetic level. When you are in the right place and energy, personally, it has an impact on everything around you and you can create the business you desire. Energy has a big impact on business, money flow, and our ability to grow. Angela combines angelic Reiki and guidance with business mentoring and coaching to get results. With a background in engineering and process design, Angela then works with businesses to bring their vision and strategy into reality. Angela is also very passionate about tigers and runs motivational speaking events 
to raise money to save the tiger from extinction. Her book raises money for the David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation, Tiger Projects. Let's hear some more, Angela. The floor is yours. Then. Thank you, Carol. Um, I'm going to dip in and out of sharing screens, if that's OK, just um, because I've, I've got a few uh, a few sort of images that I'd love to share. Um, let me just make sure that that will, that will share. Um, can you see that? Okay, is that clear for everybody? Yep, absolutely. Okay, so a little bit about me um, in a minute, but I want to ask a question first. Have you ever been in a position where you felt like the universe, God, whatever faith you hold true, just didn't have your back at the time? You buy your beautiful journal, you start putting your affirmations in place, you put your vision board in place, but things weren't happening. Maybe you hit tough times, your prayers went out, but you felt you weren't being listened to. Today is the anniversary of my dad passing, which is why I'm here speaking tonight, 13 years later, because I've been guided to talk about faith, to talk about energy, to talk about trust, and to talk about aligning with your soul's journey. So for me, um, it's taken many years for me to be in a comfortable place to talk about energy. But energy is everything. Um, and also having guidance and connection. A lot of people, have, uh, we've been talking tonight about Reiki and connection. And we're not alone, you know. And when we've got that guidance, it gives us that deeper, courageous connection, stand in our power and follow that true path. So here tonight, I am asking you to be present with an open mind. I'm going to share some insights. I'm going to share some stories to help you maybe deepen your realization in knowing spirit and, and just drop that seed of having a new perspective. So who am I? Um, I was brought up in the Welsh Valleys, um, very curious, always looking to work out how things work, spend time in nature, loving animals. Um, and that curiosity sent me into engineering. Fortunately, I had parents who really supported whatever I wanted to do. But back then, engineering was not a very kind world. Uh, and then I really learned about labels. I was a woman in a man's world. We talked a lot about cultures tonight and how, how we uh, fit in. And I really lost myself in that time. I followed that label and <laughs> became as something Shireen said as well, a perfectionist, because in that world, I had to prove myself. At every turning point, it was, you can't go there without a male director. You can't do this because you're female. And every turn became perfectionism, as we've spoken about early tonight. Everything was proving. It became the norm for me. I was a complete perfectionist and I didn't actually attempt anything unless I knew I was going to succeed and actually not succeed, smash it. So that became my, my norm. But what I found, you know, is I lost my identity and I lost that amazing thing that women have, the softer side of management, the feminine side that balances out our strong masculine. I remember not my best fashion moment wearing a shirt and tie to work to fit in. You know, I got the name Rotty, short for Rottweiler in the paper industry, because um, I, I, anything that they gave me, they knew I'd do and I'd do well. So I just sort of share a fun slide because this was my glamorous world of engineering. This was me. This is what I did. And um, I shared on the on the social media post, they drew a uh, a caricature of me in the South African paper and pulp in industries. And when I look back 20 years to this image as to what I'm doing now with angelic Reiki and angelic guidance, isn't it amazing how things come back? So I just shared this because it, it's just, you know, my fight, my determination. But when I look back, even then, they knew they had a plan. 
there was something deeper that I was there to do. And that's what I want to share tonight, because I want to talk very briefly about your soul's journey, your soul's path. Part of my coaching is to try and get people to realize that there is, we can, we can do anything we want. But if you listen to people like, I don't know whether anyone's heard of Michael Beckwith, you know, he says, you know, we, we never die and we're never born. We're here as a soul having a human experience. We came to this planet to discover, not to get, but to discover, discover all those amazing gifts that we've got inside. And our job is to come here and share them with the world. We need, we need to just go inwards. We have so much strength. It's just when we're living in this world, the best way to describe it is, is, is one big lesson for me that I want to share tonight is most of us are living an illusion based on someone else's belief. Something to really, yeah, that's something to really take home. It's everything that we've grown up, everything we've experienced. Um, most of their beliefs have nothing to do with you or them. It could even be past lives. You know, if you haven't read um, uh, Many Lives, Many Masters, Dr. Uh, what's his name, Brian Weiss, great book. But, you know, the problem is we're, we're living a life on everyone else's illusions. And what we need to do is go inwards. You know, our job is, is to reveal that beauty and that cosmic order that only in a, only a way we can. You know, if we think about it as a lampshade, our lampshade is our, our gifts, our job. You know, that might be just the way we need to bring things into the world. But underneath that lampshade is an amazing bright light that we need to bring in. And that's what we need to tap into. OK, there's a there's a there's a whole other light and a whole other shift that we need to find. And I think we spoke about it tonight is is when we get clear, those opportunities just come in when we get clear on what we want. And half the time, the one thing I would say to people when they're maybe not sure about their purpose or vision, go back to what you did as a child, go back to what you loved as a child. Chances are there's a lot of information in there. If you wanted to be out in nature, if that was one of your loves, maybe you've put it on the back burner for other things, for life, for you know, career and everything else. So that's one thing. So what was my shift? My story, um, I believe that when we're not following our path, we get a wake up call. Call it a dark night of the soul, call it whatever you want. But there are all, there's always something that happens that gives us a nudge. And when we're not listening to that purpose and not remembering that calling as to what we came here to do, that nudge, that curveball gets bigger and bigger until we listen. For me, it was like a culmination of many events. So that's why I mentioned my dad, because 13 years ago, um, I fell carrying my daughter. Um, if anyone's squeamish, please look away because I'm going to share an x-ray. But what happens is I fell. I gave myself four hernias. Um, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. Ooh, the same surgeon operated on both of us, actually. Um, and then I, I went through a number of years of quite a lot of pain, but still here driving forklifts. And what happened was they found cracks in my spine that I didn't even consider. Uh, and I needed uh, spinal surgery. So this was the state of my spine at the time. Uh, it was an, And then it was rotted up. At the same time as that, um, the engineering company that I worked for, the guys decided that they wanted to go through all of us or not at all. So I decided to walk away from the company and they put it into voluntary liquidation. So I kind of lost everything in one go. And after the after the surgery on my dad, it wasn't that long ago afterwards that I then lost him to cancer. So why am I sharing all of this? Because there was a huge moment that happened. I was fascinated as a child in everything spiritual. I'm going to move it on from that so that you don't have to look at the x-ray. I, I was always fascinated in everything spiritual. And I sat down and had a coffee with a friend of mine who was a friend for 14 years. And we sat down and she looked at me and went, oh, my good, Angela, why haven't you told me what's been going on? Um, and I looked at her and I went, well, it's, you know, we, we don't talk about these things, but I really want to see a medium because I'm missing my dad so much. And she went, do you know that medium you want to see? That's my mum. 
And by the way, I've got the gift too. And I said, but we, I've known you 14 years and how have we never talked about this? And then she just stood up and said, oh my goodness, I just want to stand over this table, wave my finger and just shout at you. But it's your nan. My nan, I, my nan was nearly 101 when she died and she was such a character. And so she did. And she shared a lot of information from my nan. Uh, my dad didn't come through at the time. He used to sit in the background, but eventually he did. We had many a coffee from that moment. And my relatives got involved every time. I felt so sorry for it because all of a sudden we had big coffees. <laughs> it, it was, it, it was, it was, it was so everything happens for a reason. So all of that time and that trauma, I'm so grateful for because that was my chance. And that was the time that everything changed. My perspective, my connection, my belief, every everything changed. And that's why I speak now about that moment and what I decided. So it was a case of what do I want to do? I was facing surgery. I went into hospital. And, and to be honest, I could have lived my ego then. I'm broken. I've got bad back. The only thing I know is engineering. What can I do now? But I just tapped into my passion. And my passion, my background was engineering quality. And all I've ever wanted was to teach people that quality needs to be in the boardroom, you know, and, and that's what we need to bring in. And so I decided to pay £80 to my old finance manager and I set up White Tiger and went, you know what, I'm going to teach people quality because that's what I love and that's what I do. And that's a starting point. And there's no wrong path, by the way. You know, we just have to decide. And just like Sarah said, once you decide and you get clear from that point, then the opportunities show up and then you'll be seen you'll see more pathways. So that's what I started to do. You know, I, I got myself out of hospital within four days, but it was that determination and that struggle in my engineering days that had given me the strength because I knew I could succeed. If I'd exceed, succeeded then, I can succeed now. And any problem that you face, just look back. You will have overcome stuff. You can overcome stuff. You will get, you'll overcome anything that you're faced with. So I got through that and I used to get through it with humor. So my mom came to live with me and I used to take her on tour of the house and to the front door to the end of the drive around the cul-de-sac. And we used to play games with it and we would get there. We just set a new goal each time. But the big thing and the reason I'm sharing this picture, this is my vision board. OK, everything I wanted went into this. And this is a talk that I did right in the beginning and and the, the guy second from the right is Warren Ryan and he dared me to run a big event I wouldn't have done it otherwise I went on his speaking course but every chain of event happened for a reason I was sat next to him in audience and I was sharing my journey he said right come on you're going to come to London you're going to speak on the stage and from then I shared my my passion for tigers and I ended up Lubbering away on, on, the, on the stage going, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to save tigers. And two people in the audience put their hand up and went, I'm in Bristol. I'm going to help you. So when we vocalize our vision, more people can help. And, and when, we, when we have that belief and we have that faith and then we vocalize it and we get that support, things start to accelerate. So you get, um, you get the clear channel, but then you move that belief into faith. And when belief is just a placeholder for knowing, when you get to the true knowing, that's when the magic happens. So you get from sense, belief, to soul, which is knowing, the deep knowing. That's what we're, that's what we're aiming for. And the trajectory just completely shifts. So that's the, uh, be I, I want to share a couple of things. Be careful what you wear, what you wish for, because um, there's a little, I'm going to share in a minute. There's a little picture right in the bottom left hand corner. I'm bearing my name all for tigers. I don't know why I put that picture on, but I'm going to share something in a minute that just, just, you know, I'd forgotten about that little picture of the lovely leopard in the corner in the journey for a lifetime. So this is how, this is how my first vision started. But the biggest lesson that I want to share with you, which I'm going to stop for a minute, because I can, I can see all your lovely faces. The biggest lesson is, is having a vision is not enough. We, sp we tap very, very quickly on energy and energy is everything. When your energy isn't right, when you're going through stuff, it's like putting a freeze frame on your business. And when you get your energy back right, you will be back in flow again. 
Energy is the foundation of our existence. It's, it's what drives all of life, you know, and it never dies. It just transmutes, you know, without energy, life would cease to exist, but we can't underestimate the power of energy in our business. I think that's why I was a little bit hesitant to, to share what I do, because imagine you're a business mentor and you're sat with this engineering director and you say, I, and, and, and there's this deep knowing, you go, I know why your business is not working because your energy is all wrong. You're not in flow. Um, <laughs> but, but it's taken me 10 years to get to that point of evidence of being in that position where things don't flow, get my energy back, seeing them flow. Um, to actually be able to share it now and energy is the driving force behind manifestation so if your energy is wrong you cannot manifest that's what law of attraction is all about so be mindful of your thoughts does anyone I don't I, I know somebody hasn't not everyone's got their their cameras on but if you have a vision board there's one thing I want to share with you if you look at any item on that vision board and you feel it in your pit of your stomach and you hear that chimp voice going, yeah, right. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> well done, Sarah. Um, if, you, if you feel any, any voice saying, yeah, in your dreams or yeah, right, you know, that's the bit you work on because that's where the energy isn't quite aligned. If you can get through that where you go, yes, I know, then that's when the manifestation will happen faster. Now, I'm going to go back to that lovely image because be careful what you wish for. The um, that little picture of the, the leopard. OK. This was my most memorable experience. You know, my spiritual journey took me to India and I will share how in a minute. But the most memorable event on that journey was this beautiful leopard that spent a lot of time. We, we just about spotted him and stopped the car and we just watched him for a long time. But that was on my vision board, journey of a lifetime. And what I did is I put this picture of a leopard. So when we have that energy, that's what happens. And if I look back, you know, um, to write in my book and, and that was sort of half channeled, half me, that was me. Um, that was my lofty spiritual ideas and my engineering and my process coming together. And when I did that, I remember um, wanting to do it for a reason, wanting to raise money for tigers and meeting this amazing lady who had traveled to go and see tigers and thinking that could never be me. But wow, what if what if I could go to India? What if I could see a tiger in the wild? And 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 all of this culminated from that decision to maybe it's possible maybe I could travel and so I got involved with David Shepherd and I went to an art exhibition and uh, I bought a picture so when my business started going the first bit of profit was spent on the picture down in the bottom right I'd made some money I needed to celebrate and by the way celebration most important thing you rob your soul of motivation going forward if you don't celebrate your milestones celebrate your achievements really celebrate them however big or however small. So I bought this image. And then what happened is when I got to India, I went and met the person that painted that picture who lives on the edge of the tiger, uh, the tiger reserve. So it was absolutely incredible how everything came full circle. And when I actually got where I wanted to go, um, I ended up meeting him that, that painted the painting in my lounge. So it's all about being in flow. So I'm going to pop in and out of these because I, I I can see you all. I don't know whether anyone's heard of the Taoist Wu Wei talk about being in flow. It's described as effortless effort or non-action is a better way of saying it. And it's about being in alignment with the flow of nature, with the universe. And it's all about life is effortless and life doesn't have to be a struggle. And when we're in the right energy, work can just flow and when we go into fear and we're worried about not having enough clients guess what energy we put out and guess what the law of attraction brings to us not enough clients because that's what we're focused on you know and when we're looking at all this professional development we look at I must have some limiting beliefs there must be something wrong 
So guess what we find more of? Limiting beliefs. So instead of doing that, look at where you want to go. Look at those people that are already there. What do they believe? What are they doing? What are they achieving? And how do you become that? How do you bring yourself into the zone, in, the, in with those people to believe what you need to believe? What do you hold true to get where you want to be? Don't go hunting the limiting beliefs and don't go into fear because you can absolutely do it. And when we're aligned with our vision, we'll naturally see the opportunities. I don't know whether anyone's heard of the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Now, even back in the 60s, 70s, he writes about the sixth sense. If you haven't noticed it, go back. And there's this lovely little quote in there, which I've always held true, which is, you'll be warned of impending dangers in time to avoid them, notified of opportunities in time to embrace them, and there comes to your aid and to your bidding with the development of the sixth sense, a guardian angel who will open the doors at all times to the temple of wisdom. Now that's in a business book. And that's what I work with is angels. For some, it's harder to um, the harder to sort of get to grips with. But for me, it's it's what accelerated my vision board was to get aligned with that, to have faith and guidance. Faith from within, guidance from the angels about quieting your mind and just listening. Because life is so busy. We're all on this hamster wheel and we just, the busy we are, the better it is. But we don't stop and quieten and ground. My favourite thing is barefoot in the grass. If ever I'm really busy, you'll notice I'm the one with my shoes and socks off, going to walk in the grass, going to ground. And then, and then it comes in the silence. So that was the process I followed. So if if you take anything, it's take this process away, which we've touched on, set the intention, make the decision, okay? Find that vision, find that purpose and take that decision and then visualize it. To go to India, I was petrified. But what I did, I started to visualize being safe, seeing myself there, seeing myself guided. And then the most important bit, which we have touched on very slightly, is letting go, surrendering to what is. Let go of the attachment to where you need to be. Just know that you're on the right path. And don't go hunting for those signs. They'll pop up. When they pop up, you'll know about it. And I'll share some of the signs that helped me go to India in a minute. But then when you take action, take action quickly. When that opportunity comes, grasp it. But make sure the action you're taking is heart-led. Okay? Get out of your head and breathe into your heart and make sure those decisions are heart-led just for you that's that's the my one uh, one biggest advice follow your heart and take action when you see those signs so let's think about just very quickly these signs everyone told me that going to india will be a different op- a different person the opportunity would be amazing but i wasn't sure i knew i was guided i knew i'd made the decision i knew i, I wanted to go so i asked the question was i meant to go to india and this was February 2018, so it was a while ago. And, and so I took my mum for a coffee, and it was an angelic Reiki meetup, and we just went for a coffee. And my question that day, and we only need to ask it once, just keep that connection open and go, I let go of everything, I'm just trusting, but I, I need some more confirmation. And it's not wrong, you just reach out and ask for a little bit more confirmation. And I was in a busy cafe, it was very noisy, and all of a sudden the noise dropped. And this lady went, oh, of course, that's when I came back from India in February. And I was like, did I, did I hear that? Was I, was, I, was I right? So I had a sign. So I was just in gratitude. And I said, thank you. And then my next question was, am I safe to go to India? You know, am I safe? Um, and I had a, a, a guy that I spoke on stage with and, and suddenly had a call to go and have a coffee with them. So I thought, that's great. I'll sit there. And he, he was really hot. And he went, oh, I don't normally do this. I said, are you okay? And he went, no, I need to channel my spirit guide. I said, okay. So he channeled Sanat Kumara, who's one of the ascended masters. And he said, the message for you is you're safe. And he's coming to India with you and you're guided. And it's okay. So that was a coffee with a business guy. And I just knew that that, that was it then. From that moment, um, Sanat Kumara has been in my life all the way through. I decided to follow Angelic Reiki. And the day I decided to pay up for the course was the day the teacher had some new wisdom and Sinat Kamara came into the attunement meditation and she delivered 
And I went back to the teacher. I said, did I hear that name? I, did I really hear that name when you did the, the meditation? He said, yes, absolutely. Um, so he, he's been around a long time. And I, and I will share that, you know, a, a few things later on now. Um, but, it, but I started to gain my confidence. I started to believe that all of this was true. I was guided. I could do my Reiki. I could share uh, what I believe. And when, you're, when you do that, it just makes everything more powerful. It makes everything happen faster. Um, where my journey goes next, you know, deeper offerings, healing, Reiki, you know, I'm just excited. But I will say, you know, we, we have to let go because I got frustrated. You know, why can't I see people like my medium friend? Why can't I? But we, we have to get out of fighting energy. We don't need anything. We just have to trust. So what I get, I find is, is people come into my life for a reason. Um, one of my latest clients is a, an amazingly powerful healer. And as, as I'm here to enable light workers, that's that's the people I'm here to coach. And so she has channeled Sanat Kumara many times and, and he's come through and told me about a temple in Japan that I need to go to. It's the birthplace of Reiki, coincidence or 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 um and I, I've looked at, you know, the angelic oracle guidance and a teacher called um, Carl Gray. Look him up if you haven't seen him. In, and um, he's the only person I've known that talks about Sanat Kamara, the, the guide. And um, I bought his oracle cards. And guess what the first card was that popped out? Sanat Kamara. So it, it's very connected. So we talked about COVID briefly. And that was a chaotic, you know, time. And the one thing I will share is when you get into flow and when you get into knowing the last thing it will give you is inner peace. One of my biggest missions when I first started my business, which I didn't want to share because it sounded too cliche, was, was to bring peace and harmony. When we're not at conflict inside, we're not at conflict with others. And, and we, 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 we operate in harmony. You know, there's not conflict in the world. It's like ripples in a pond. So one of my one of my big things was just to try and try and get peace. And what happened over over COVID is is someone in my family got very poorly. And there was a lot going on in the world. And I just went back inwards to the guidance. And the NHS treatment was not the best. They were great, but they were following the, the rule books. Um, and everything that I got shown about healing was coming through strongly. So the lady that I used was in Milton Keynes in rapid transformational therapy. And she, her logo was angel wings, the same as my Reiki, Reiki logo. So it was all adding up. Um, and then I met an energy worker who literally found an entity that was causing the illness. And when she released it like a cloak, uh, it improved things within a couple of hours. And then I was in a waiting room and someone walked in and went, I need to work with you and your family. And they were connected to the Shibibo tribe in the Amazon, who are the ayahuasca masters, who did a, okay, who did a ceremony for me and healed us. And so it, it's amazing. Stay the course, believe, and you just never know. I would never have visualized I'd be working with someone in the Amazon, but everything shifts when you get into that belief and you get into that knowing and out of that fighting energy that everybody is in today generally <laughs> so I, I will leave you with a couple of quotes that that help me tremendously one of them is I'll put them up on the board one of them is stop fighting yourself except where you are in life is that sharing am I still sharing yeah uh no no hang on then ah, let me that's not sharing let me go back I'll just say them. So when I, when I was going through my spinal surgery, there was a big thing about acceptance. So Robert Chu says, stop fighting yourself, accept where you are in life. Let this time motivate you to let go of all things that are holding you back. And the other one is the past. This is Eckhart Tolle, a new earth, if anyone's read the book. The past has no power to stop you from being present now. Only your grievance about the past can do that. And what, what, is, what is grievance? It's just baggage. It's just emotions mm -hmm. about the past, and that's what holds us back. So decide oh. what you want, just go for it, because we've got, choose, choose courage over convenience. 
we've we've heard a lot tonight about just going for it and having that bravery and courage you're guided you're never alone you've always got a guardian angel with you so there's never a wrong path okay thank you angela um you're welcome we've I'm not sure how much time we've got left for Q&A, um, <laughs> but the floor is open very, sh um, we'll have to be, we'll have to truncate it, but the floor mm -hmm. is now open if you've got any questions. But thank you for sharing, Angela. Well, I just want to say thank you, Angela. It's great. You know, all the stuff that you, you've you talked about is all the stuff that, you know, I'm fully aware, fully aware of. <laughs> it's I've had so much challenging times that even when you know that, sometimes you, you can get to taken off course, but and then you start to question the fact that you you know this stuff, but then you, you but you know, I have I've just literally and exactly what you say about when you get blocked, you just then attract more of the block, but sometimes then trying to get out of your way, even when you mm. know this stuff and you live it, you breathe it, and you 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 are it. But thankfully, and it's just so nice to have been here and online tonight and listening to you because you know I've literally that sort of it's just kind of started to lift and it's just so such a timely divine timing reminder and all the things you're going oh, away. oh yes I've got my vision board I'm, I'm doing this and I've done that and I've done Reiki and I've been to India and <laughs> it's just lovely hearing you talk thank you you're welcome it's all about energy though we just need it's, to stay out of fear but in this climate in this world it's all over the place well that's yeah. the problem isn't it and you think about the people that we are that know this and understand it and if that's impacting people who understand energy and I do like you do you can then have you, you it then empowers you to understand how people who don't must be feeling absolutely right yeah absolutely thank you I yield the floor to any of our guests who would like to ask any questions Hi, I want to say thank you very much for this session. My name is Natalie. Um, I probably might be the youngest person on here. I'm, I might be wrong. But as a 33-year-old, I have so much, like, not worry, but I kind of fear about the future with there being so much uncertainty going on. And I wanted to ask Angela, like, any advice you'd give a young woman, like, <laughs> in general? I know that's a bit broad, but yeah. I, th I think um, when you think about fear, um, I, I always ask myself, firstly, is it mine? And then what am I making it mean about me, about the, if it's involving another person or a situation? What am I making that mean? Because quite often, either it's not us or we're, we, there's a reason we're feeling that way. And it might be that you need a safe space and someone to hold that space for you to explore that because that's the shadow work that may be that may uh, uncover deep beliefs or trauma. But that's that's where I would always start. You know, is it mine? You know, what am I making it mean? But there's lots of other coaches in the room, but I'm sure that would have um, other opinions. And also, if you're listening to news and, and, and scaremongering and try and take a break from it or social media for a bit take a breather I would I, I would say that exactly Angela yeah if you're listening to the news switch it off surround yourself with people that are more positive that are uplifting that are upbeat <coughs> podcasts <coughs> um, I'm going to put a plug in there have a listen to my harnessing happiness podcast there's lots of content on there about 150 episodes with amazing guests and um, empowering stuff but it's how you view the world and it's how you frame your thoughts and your words, your actions. And if you can start to think about things more positive, I know we, we, it, this is hard because we don't know what particularly you, you want to look at and explore, but it's mm. small shifts in your internal language and the words that you can use that can make the biggest difference. So every time you're thinking mm. of a negative, if you can then counteract that with a positive, and you start the day with gratitude and appreciation. And, you know, even if it's just thankful that, you know, you've woken up, you've had a sl you've slept, whether you've had a good night's sleep or not, you've had a bed that you slept in or whatever it is, any little thing that you can feel grateful for. And it's it builds and it builds and it builds. You'll go off track. I've been off track, you know, but just keep building and just keep believing and trusting. 
when when you're in gratitude or serving energy it actually ups your vibration so your manifestation and your connection is actually much much clearer so try doing something of service for someone else or be in gratitude before you actually talk yeah awesome i haven't watched television in four years don't miss it don't need it (laughs) yeah Wow. Hope that's helped a little, Natalie. Yes, please. If there's any particular podcasts, can you put them in the chat so that I can actually save them, please? I remember the lady mentioned, Sarah, I think she mentioned the podcast. Yes, she's going to put them in the chat. And one thing I'll always remember. Thank you. Nothing happens to us, only through us. We're responsible for what we let mm. in to infect us. Mm. So barrier up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm all. Mm-hmm. I'm always happy to link up with someone and share book lists and reading lists, and you know, the more we share, the better. Awesome. And Natalie, can I ask? Uh, can I add here? I mean, wonderful advice, everyone. Can I just add? You, you young. You said uh, when you get uh, a little older, you understand and you accept that everything that you're going through, everything that's happening, this is temporary. Mm-hmm. This too shall pass, and. This quote, one quote, has saved my life so many times mm. when, you know, people feel that they're stuck. What next? Whether I'd survive this? What if I don't? When we start questioning ourselves, this is actually temporary. Everything is. So if you can remember that when you're going through this negative mindset at any point, that may help as well. And Kushali UK's website has got a wealth of these um these sessions that we have had with some wonderful women from around the world just like tonight um if you'd like to visit that i'd put put the website um address on the chat we also have a youtube channel you can visit yeah amazing amazing anyone else oh pratiba sorry i didn't see your hand up (laughs) go for it Thank you. Uh, yeah, fantastic session as always. Uh, thank you for coordinating and you know inviting all these amazing speakers. Um, in particular, I did actually resonate with you, Angela, and I think uh, I'll put that in the chat. But uh, yeah, um, so just wanted on on energy, just a couple of questions. You know, um, how does one protect their own energy? So you know, if you're encountering um, other people, perhaps you know vibrating at lower levels or whatever um or you're in a, a situation where you've um, just you know absorbed energy obviously in the I'm, I'm not actually in the um physically treating people kind of uh session just yet but i am actually learning healing as well pranic healing you know so we talk about healing people i asked my physiotherapist the other day you know how do you protect your own energy so that's one thing i wanted to uh you know get get your perspective on uh secondly if uh, somebody is procrastinating and not actually getting things done, uh, how does that relate to, is that because of their low energy or negative energy or um, their mindset, you know, um, and how does, how, how would you uh, advise on that, you know, how to move forward? Um, um, I'm very interested in, in your uh, trip to India, uh, but just particularly, you know, your best moment and your challenging moment, um, I'd be really, really fascinated to hear of that. Um, and finally, the work you're doing on tigers. I will actually, have to, I'll save the chat as well. Uh, but uh, that's an uh, animal of my passion as well, you know. So I'm very interested in in the work that you're doing. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll look that up and maybe connect with you outside of this meeting. Because obviously, I'm conscious of time. But, uh, yeah, thank you so much. It was an amazing session. Love oh, to thank to you, all of you. Even. Bless you. Um, I don't know how I don't know how to answer that firstly the energy is 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 something I've learned is about you know actually just taking a breath and actually uh, actually just imagining that golden light completely surrounding you in your orb before you even go out in the day is just just accept that you know you can put that up yourself quite easily just to protect yourself and if you do find yourself in a low uh, energy room where your energy is being sapped then take yourself out and take a breath and and find some way of grinding and restoring that energy. Mm. You know, I will quite often go out barefooted and just connect again. 
that you mm. can actually in it's early in the morning and actually shake it off if you've been somewhere shake it off mm. um um yeah um what else do I start <laughs> what was the second question about um oh yeah procrastination I'm an yeah. MBA coach which is multi-brain integration technique and quite often if we're procrastinating we're in our head uh, and 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 doing the embit the meditation coming down from head to heart to gut um actually you can get some new wisdom by talking to your whole body rather mm. than you know quite often I find people are in their head a lot and we need to come out of that some way um or even just take a breath you know when you before you ask before you answer the question stop take a breath um and and just pause uh, and go back in before you answer mm. yeah That's good. awesome yeah, I think with procrastination, it's a, it's a really interesting thing because I, there's it seems to be a lot of things that sit behind procrastination, which is really fear. <laughs> Invariably, it's more about fear than anything else. It's not because you're lazy or anything like that. So start to look for the root cause of it, right? Just start to go, well, what is it that I'm already afraid of here? Because that's where your energy is being sapped. And that's where all the attention is going rather than on, focusing on something else and you're feeling and, and, and normally when you progress it you, your energy starts to go down right mm -hmm. so you want to find ways that you can actually bring your energy up and there's no better way of actually making sure nothing comes in is actually making sure you've got enough energy that it pushes things out rather than in so you want to be walking as this bundle of energy um, and if you do that then first of all things can't come in things can't invest you but I think if you can really look to see what's underneath that part of you and looking at it, you can then talk to it and ask it, what is it? What am I afraid of? What, what do I think I can't do? Whose story is that? Who told me that I can't do this? Because when you start to do that, you, there's another part of your brain, a wise part of your brain. The moment you start to go in, there's this other wisdom that always comes up. And actually, it's, it is also a very logical brain mechanism that happens. And so when you know that, you can go, okay, I can move more into that other part of my brain because just taking time to go in builds it. So uh, Sandra was talking about doing these micro, move, micro kinds of thing exercises. These things build our brain. They build it up enough so that when we have those procrastination or fear kinds of driven thoughts, the other part comes up and strengthens and it can mitigate for these. So just give yourself that moment just to ask those questions. Yeah. It's just even simply asking, does, does it? It brings you into a bigger level. Mm. Yeah. Just I think in addition with, with that, um, it's really also um, thinking you need to be perfect <laughs> when, you, when you're doing the task. That, yeah, the perfect, you, you're always trying to, that's that's one of the things I have, and I'm trying to work on it as well because uh, mm -hmm. they say you can never be so perfect, and uh, if you want to achieve something, stop trying mm -hmm. to be that perfect because you you're just wasting a lot of time and energy mm -hmm. there as well. But uh, yeah, so something that uh, is good food for thought. But yeah, thanks yeah. for that. The yeah. perfection is in the imperfection. Yeah. Yeah, something. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, you spoke about it, didn't you? Yeah, perfection. <laughs> Quite a lot. Perfection is in the I did. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly, it is. It is yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a fear. Yeah, it's yeah. a fear, and it and it is a fear that's caused by somebody else, normally not you. So mm -hmm. really, kind of look at who you're still carrying, right? That's that, that's busy still telling you and living your life today that shouldn't be there, really. Yeah, I've had quite a transition from uh, the world of IT of over 40 years corporate working. Last two years, I was made redundant, so I took early retirement. But uh, mm -hmm. I've got such a passion for healing and um, helping people. And, you know, just uh, I have a strong, strong love for meditation and yoga, which I do practice. And now learning this pranic healing and my faith, you know, we talked about faith quite a lot. And um, that, you know, there's so much to be said for the power of prayers and um yeah, just connecting to your source that, uh, you know, but I think it's just this transition, you know, and um, working, I'm, I'm, you know, uh, walking on that path and I have faith in myself. But the thing is, there's just something, something quite not um, letting me do that, you know, and I really I have to work on it more. But 
Yeah, I'm generally a very positive person and everything, but I think I've had quite a massive um, a side of the job and, you know, a quite transition from working and now this type of uh, life of retirement. But I do a lot of things. I enjoy myself. I've, you know, traveled and things, but I just want to do something very useful going forward, you know, which can help people as well. So, yeah. And Rita's think, been my backbone. <laughs> don't, don't forget that, you know, if you, I mean, I've got a background in recruitment and careers and things like that. That has been a massive, massive part of your life. Mm. You know, and you have made this big transition and it's like people who've been made redundant after a long period of time or massive thing that, you know, I did some work with um, some people that made redundant after like 25 years with Topshop two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like a bereavement when you've lost it's that big part of your life. So you know, just be gentle to yourself, be kind to yourself. You know, you're just mm -hmm. going through a transition period, but it's yeah. also that you've found something you're passionate about. And, you know, just just allow. And you, we, we've been talking about being, Angela was talking about being in flow. Just allow yeah. it. To flow. You've, got to, you've got to let go. We have to learn. It will it will be a, a letting go. And most of the people I work with that are healers have had work in engineering, in accounts, in IT. We have to extreme. We have to experience the one strong logical side to then go into the other side of believing what we can't see and yes. and, and I think that's it we have to we have to experience the true mm. logic engineering world IT world and then and to, to move into the other extreme it's yeah. just something that happens <laughs> yeah sadly Thank you so we're gonna have to wrap this up now Sorry. <laughs> but please 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 everyone save the chat there's valuable mm information and yes. links in the chat so please save the chat and having said that I always forget <laughs> so I'm going to do it right now <laughs> right uh save chat so I'd like to oh my goodness <laughs> I'm just going in the order of my screen so Sarah heartfelt thanks for saying yes this has been in the making for a long time I couldn't get you on any sooner <laughs> uh, so thank you Shireen thank you thank you there's some things I wanted to um but I've seen them in your posts about the disparity of ethnic minorities and pregnancy in the NHS etc 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 but that's a topic for another occasion and Pamela Thank you so much. And yes, you are workshop ready. <laughs> <laughs> so much I wanted to ask you about CBDC, etc., and how that would work. <laughs> um, and Angela, thank you again from the bottom of my heart for coming and sharing with us. You have all been exceptional and I really appreciate you. And Ritu, thank you for this platform that we can invite amazing speakers to share their story and their expertise with the world <laughs> because it's not just who's here on tonight um it will be on the youtube channel and it will be on the kashulia uk website um so for those attending pratiba thank you for your support pushpa mariana natalie lavanya ranjit and iphone <laughs> whoever iPhone is <laughs> thank you for <laughs> joining us this evening we valued um your company and I hope you've got something out of it I know I have and I think you all have so if you haven't saved the chat this is your final opportunity to save it before Ritu closes us out <laughs> Oh, well, I just want to say, yes, thank you. Carol has thanked everyone on behalf of Kushila UK. So ladies, thank you so much for spending your valuable time and sharing all the wisdom and the expertise and the value-filled um, information you have shared tonight with us. We are going to value this for a very long time. And this does go very far. I mean, even people who are not here will visit the videos and they'll they'll watch it. And we are creating this wave of positivity and empowerment for one and for all. So thank you for your contribution. Mm -hmm. Please feel free to offer a web, uh, workshop. Actually, we're requesting you to do that. If you'd be happy to uh, give your 40, 45 minutes of a workshop to Kushilia UK. 
And we can't leave without saying a big thank you to our lead volunteer, Carol, uh, for working in the background and making this all happen and bringing such quality people to the platform. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the day, evening, night, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.